Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Next Level. I'm JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark. I'm coming to you live from New York City, the morning after Joe Biden's first State of the Union address. Sarah, I had a question for you. No, I got cut off. Now, hold on. Okay. What, what you didn't did you get, get cut, cut off, Tim. Just somebody is asking somebody else a question that isn't you. Okay, I just, I just thought, anyway... Go ahead. Sarah, I am having a weird whiplash in the realization that the two most effective and best presidents of my lifetime are Ronald Reagan and Joe Biden. Yeah, Tim, the reason he's coming to me is because he wants to do his, like, Joe Biden victory lap, and I'm, he, he that's, that's why. Uh, okay, well, I just thought we might just take a moment to discuss the fact that JVL's like little nit dig at me there because I am coming at you live from New York City. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are coming at rise. you live. Um, we are coming at you Jersey live from anyway, New so, York City. Uh, JVL's a little sad that I didn't just swing over to visit him 45 minutes south in central Jersey if it was not during rush hour. <laughs> Two and a half hours if it was a rush hour trip. But uh, besides that, it would have been it would have been nice to see you. And I apologize. I apologize. I'm sorry about that. But please, Sarah, continue your assessment of Joe Biden, greatest president ever or second greatest president ever. <laughs> I'm just saying in our lifetimes, we have had we have had like three reasonably effective presidencies. Sure, sure, sure. And those have been Reagan, Clinton and Biden. And believe me, nobody finds that weirder than I do. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, we're talking about one speech last night, uh, but I will, I will say, uh, for, it was a very, it was quite, it was a quite effective speech, even with, uh, sort of the word, the word gumbo that happens when he's, like, rushing through stuff, even with that, uh, even with some of the weird moments where I was like, wait, what did he say? What is, or, or, or the back and forth where I was like, wait, what is happening right now? Why is he doing a call and response? <laughs> Why are we having a conversation? I'm super stressed out. But for a state of the union, which is usually this like very boring PowerPoint of a thing, watching him kind of bounce in there, just happy as a clam, making jokes I didn't understand because he wasn't quite spitting them out right. Uh, he did look like the happy warrior and the little, I mean, the best part was when he got into that joust with the Republicans and then owned them on it. Uh, like, he he stuck with it. I was like, you're off script, bro. Don't do it. Don't do it. Ever, this is bad. And then when he was like, you know, we're all in agreement. No cuts to Medicare and Social Security. Uh, I, I love conversions, Corn Pop. It was amazing. It was. It was amazing. It was a, it was a great speech. And I think... Um, you know, I was not doing an interview yesterday and they were like, well, what does Joe Biden need to talk about in his speech? And I was like, I don't care what he talks about. What Joe Biden has to do is make sure that everybody's looking at him and thinking, yeah, he could do this two years from now, probably. And I felt like he accomplished that. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a win. Yeah. I, uh, so just to demonstrate that I'm not a homer before we start this, I'm going to, I mm -hmm. want to confess something about that's happening in the interior, the interior life of Tim. <laughs> an interior life of a gay man, which is very important in, in cinema, something that we spend a lot of time dealing with. Um, Not Kristen cinema, you mean the movies. In the movies, yeah. Um, but it's a, the inter her interior life is also interesting, um, yeah. but that's for another day. Um, I had a thought yesterday that just kind of crossed my brain that was like, man, maybe it'd be nice if he did really bad, because that would just sort of kickstart the kind of discussion of like we're not so sure that he can do it you know because it'd be better on balance it'd be better for him to be to to demonstrate decline never right that'd be the best case scenario so that he's you know some kind of he does some sort of benjamin button type scenario uh, the next best case would be you know that he would he would demonstrate decline as soon as possible right so that you could resolve it right like the worst case scenario is that you'd demonstrate decline like debate two of the yeah, general election, that's right. right? That's right. Um, so that's something that's just a little nervous in my head, and that 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 ner that's going to be a low level anxiety from now all the way till till next fall. Um, but uh, so so I say that to say I I, I wasn't like re go ready to go in there and be like rip off my shirt and reveal my Joe Biden T shirt and his in his in his aviators. Same. And oh, like okay, JVL. And yeah, yeah, please, JVL. And <laughs> um, come on, <laughs> don't. 
don't insult us. <laughs> um, the uh, but I wish I brought my aviator shirt. To, to New York City, where I am right now, uh, because I would be wearing it today. Well, it's chilly, but I would if I could have an under. It's pretty tight too, so if there's a way to put it over top of something, I would wear it. And because um, he was phenomenal, I like I, really quite good. I like even not grading on a curve, good um, last night. Um, I, I thought I, I thought that I, there were certain things that I I did that you could nitpick. He, I guess, if you're gra- I saw Sarah's face, so I guess if you're grading on the curve of like, was it? The greatest oration since Cicero? No, okay, but like just as a political speech, as a serving a function of of not not grading him just based on the fact that he's eighty, but just saying, hey, did a politician succeed at at achieving their political goals, delivering a message, you know, and inspi- being in, at times inspiring, a little funny. Uh, engaging. Yeah, he did. He did. He was good last night. I thought the message was good. Like I said, I want to nitpick a few of the things, but, um, you know, the call and response though was definitely the highlight. I was also like Sarah doing the no, 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 no. Yes. Thing. Uh, like, like, please don't do this. No, but I, I think that it achieved the main, like the best case scenario for him last night was a, to show energy, which he did that he capability, which he did. And to have uh, some Republicans behave like lunatics and have him seem kind of normal by comparison. And the call and response allowed that to happen. And then he achieved, I think even a higher degree of difficulty of like kind of doing the Joe Biden thing, which is like, okay, we made a deal. It's like deal and Joe doing it live. All right, here we go. I don't – it annoys me that, like, then a lot of you – I do feel like the regular pundits, you know, your your both sides pundits, are, were giving a little bit more credibility to the Republicans for the booing. I mean, all Joe Biden was doing was quoting Rick Scott's fucking proposal. Like, that's all he was doing, was literally quoting one <laughs> Republican – and he wouldn't say the guy's name. I, that was, my, I guess, my one critique. I wish he would have been like, guys, why, why are you yelling at me? He's like, I, like, let's just yeah, print like, it. He let's it. Let's just print yeah. it out. He should have pointed at Senator Rick Scott He's and said, right there. Rick, he tell ran them. the NRSC. He's sitting right there. <laughs> yeah. Rick, do you have your hand out with you? Could you could you pass that around, Rick? Yeah, he ran the NRSC. It's not just some random guy. So anyway, um, I, I I thought that he really that that part was was uh, was the best for sure. Um, uh, how about that? So uh, I should say we should stipulate that none of this matters. I don't, should. Think. That's, that's I don't think important. I don't think there th- <laughs> this you, matters JBL. to us for purposes of uh understanding where Joe Biden is as a politician. It understand it it is important to us in terms of placing the two parties on a continuum and understanding in which directions they are moving in terms of practical political effects. I think it it moves the needle zero one way or the other. Well, wait, I guess I'm not positive about that. I, I do think, so I was in this, uh, Michelle Goldberg from the New York Times had called me like two days ago and was like, what do your focus group say about Joe Biden running again? And I told her the truth, which is that everybody says they don't want him to run um, and they don't think he should and that they think he's too old. And she had written a piece that I guess was not either, it was either yesterday or the day before that came out, I think maybe it was yesterday. And it was like, Joe Biden has been a tremendous president and he should not run again. And she like quotes me in it. Uh, but I saw her, she wrote a, a piece in the New York Times, everybody was doing like these like quick evals of the speech, and she was like, you know, if that guy shows up all the time, i change my mind. Like, I'd, I'd, I would withdraw. And so I think that as a practical political matter, there has been a kind of, everybody's aware of the timeline. Everyone is aware of the, what, the dynamic that Tim laid out, which is there's a, t- a period of time, a window of time, and we're in it where Joe Biden can say he's not running again and give the Democrats an opportunity to find an alternative. Um, And even that's going to be messy and it's a little dangerous. And these are some of the main reasons why these are not things that you do lightly. Um, And I would say just like the 22 midterms, this speech goes a long way to quieting the punditocracy. So I think that's maybe part of the political effect because I, I mean, I I think a lot of people just watch that speech and they're like, yeah, I mean, can he still do this, you know, at 82? Because he's 80 now when he's doing, when he's running. Uh, I don't know. But th- there was, it, it like, I don't know. You're sort of like, how am I going to just keep arguing this when, you know, he can get up there and, like, do a pretty good job. I have some, and I have a lot of substance things I want to get into, but, like, style, which I thought was the most important. I just think he, I think he hit that, and I do think that has a practical political effect, I would say. But you're right. Like, average Americans aren't watching it, but I think it has an effect on the pundit class. Yeah, I mean, I- 
So I, I would say one thing that I think is underrated about Biden is that he is a creature of Congress in a way that no president in our lifetimes has been. I mean, uh, Obama did like a hot four years in the Senate. I think two. And that was it. Was it four? Uh, H two. Two, maybe George, two maybe it was ran. two. George H.W. Bush was in the House, but, you know, a bazillion years before he became president. Like Biden spent 35 years in Congress or something like that. Like his... He does not have the temperament of an executive. He has the temperament of a deal maker and a backslapper and, uh, you know, hey, we all get along. -er. And so that's why he can walk into a room like that. And he I just think he approaches it. Hey, split the difference. Thank you, Sebastian. Obama was in the Senate for three years. Um, uh, he just approaches a State of the Union, it turns out, differently than all other chief executives in an our timelines, right? Which has been, you know, they're up there to be the big boss and tell people how it is. And I mean, Biden's up there given the Congress credit for every, like everything he was like, we did it, right? And it was a very bipartisan speech for most of it. I mean, he went out of his way. This is the weird thing, right? Biden went out of his way to, to talk about things that some Republicans wanted to do. And say, and I understand this isn't a position of your party. And this isn't what all of you think. He said this about Ukraine. He said this about the debt ceiling. He said this about uh, cuts to Social Security, Medicare. I mean, he was, he opened by by congratulating uh, Mike Kevin about getting the, the precious speakership ba uh, gavel. He, he For being the longest he running. Mitch, right? You see, and Mitch, Mitch looked so unhappy with it. Like Kevin, in a weird way, was actually kind of, like, happy to him, too. Like, he's so into the gavel that even though he realized it was probably bad for him to be being praised by Biden, he couldn't resist. Like, ha, 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 yeah. Um, Mitch did not like it. It just, I don't know. Like, this is Biden's default setting is the before times version of American politics, mm -hmm. which is sausage making. And he clearly enjoyed that more than any other president I've ever seen give a State of the Union. Um, like Clinton sort of enjoyed the performative aspects of it, but there's a lot of like lower lip biting and, you know, he saw it as like a, a Shakespearean monologue. And this was like the friar's roast for Biden. He was super into it. <laughs> I do so. think, I do think Biden relaxed and happy because, you know, he does oratorily, he kind of rushes through things through a kind of clenched teeth and like squinty eyes, like the lights must be bright and he's had a lot of Botox and so, like, I, was say, I think it's Botox. I, he's had a lot of Botox, but he um, he was happy, and that was palpable. And I gotta say, this is what I was. I was turned to my wife, and I was like, I don't know. I was like, this is just like cheering me up. Uh, like it just it, it was. It was. It was having a, a a nice effect on me watching him when he was thanking Mitch. I was like, this is great. I just and 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 this even is what I, we all wanted. And you know right? what? When his big verbal slips, and, and there were some of them, but like he didn't confuse major sort of military countries that we're in conflict with. He just called Schumer the minority leader, which I was like, <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Uh, how how big's that majority? I mean, he did seem like a like a like a loose grandpa. How big's that majority down there, Chuck? Chuck's holding up one figure. <laughs> Uh, and he's calling him the minority leader. That stuff's great. Like, whatever. And the, yeah, I think that also goes to the back and forth, which we kind of discussed, right? Which was, he liked that. He was happy. Biden seemed happy to come to the conclusion. It's like, all right, guys. Yeah. We did this one. We, we resolved this one. We don't need to, we, we can just move on the next time we got to get together to deal with the debt ceiling thing, because this is now off the table. I'm glad we all agree. All right, now let's move it on forward. And um, And yeah, I was watching... This was at Chuck Todd afterwards, and I I love I love Heidi Heitkamp about as much as anybody that I've ever uh, to my husband worked for her, and I just I love the Christmas parties. She's a great person. She's on the Bulwark podcast every once in a while. She cusses great, but she did a little bit of like, oh I don't know. I felt like that was outside of decorum kind of commentary on that exchange. And I did, that was just one area I was like, I don't think so. I think that's good. You know, that was a little raucous. And they're shouting, you're a liar. And he's like, what are you talking about, Jack? And, you know, they're going back and forth. And I, I, I thought, I mean, I thought that some of the Republicans looked a little 
classless. You know, like MTG looked like a little bit like she was, you know, at a at at the Chili's, like heckling the you know the the Friday night uh, uh, entertainment. But all, all in all, I thought that that. Like again, it's kind of what we want. I, I thought it was like this melding of our new world with yeah. kind of an, someone from the old world who's like, who has like that decorum and is okay with is ha- and it's like fine. You can throw shout a name at me, but we'll just still cut a deal, and that's all good. That's that's a superpower of Biden. So I yeah. think that really worked to his favor. It, it felt it, like the before times. Well, yeah, because right? it, it felt not like the Republicans Plus were being shouting. hostile. Like right, like. One of the things that was I was taking away is like the, the the mood with Trump was like dark in this way, the American carnage kind of way that made you feel sort of sick to your stomach. There was one part that made me feel a little gross, uh, and that was Kevin's face, and not just as Muppet face in general, but like the face that he was making. And it seemed like maybe he was practicing because he had it. He had it like very studied the same the boredom. Whole time. Studied boredom. There you go. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the oh, I'm the jock. You know, and we're in this class that they're making me take, or like I've got to go do, or or maybe it's like the jock that had to do a sexual harassment training. Maybe <laughs> afterwards, they're sitting there and just kind of like rolling their eyes at the process. And I, you know, I, I, I didn't like, I didn't love it, and and my contempt for him was rising over the course of the hour. Um, hard for me to judge whether that was just me or whether that was something that maybe. An average voter would have also felt, like we said, maybe average voters aren't really even watching this, so it doesn't matter. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I, he 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 was he was the only thing that was affecting my my uplifting Longwell esque bipartisan spirit um, of the evening. I wish he could have just the only thing. I don't know. How about Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Yeah, I was gonna say in terms of like people who cause my skin to crawl. And this has been uh, a feature of the modern sort of Trump Republican Party that causes me like a little, um, I feel disoriented by it because the way that people would call Trump, they would be like, well, he's charming, he's charismatic. And I'd be like, that's interesting because I find him absolutely repellent. Like the sound of his voice, (laughs) the look of his face, his stupid hair, like everything about it makes my skin crawl. Her slack jawed, like delivery of things is uh, just I cannot I fake yeah it, it, it's it's she is she is I I find her utterly repellent I like there's no part of me that is interested in listening to her words he's got like dead eyes um, I just uh, because she knows better uh, I I know uh, she and I are roughly the same age I we we share many friends in common she was sort of in D C too. I know lots of people who know her. This is like, she's just an Elise Stefanik type who saw the power win shift and totally changed who she was. And like when she was doing the press briefings, I felt the same way. I was like, this person is not talented. And so when the whole Republican Party is like, this is our star. This is our next generation. I'm like, she's a Nepo baby. Really? She's just, she's just another Nepo baby. And, uh, but here's what I thought was interesting. Um, So Biden's speech was was mostly bipartisan, sought to credit Republicans, sought to distinguish the views of some Republicans from the others. Uh, it was very substantive in that, you know, he's talking about like the tax tax uh, taxes passed on hotel bills and stuff like that. You know, it was all all economy, economy, economy with a little bit of climate change and a, a dash of abortion thrown in. And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders is like, you know, they want you to worship their false idols with the woke mob and their Marxist <laughs> BLM and anti- And it was like, what, what version of the Democratic... She is not running against the Democratic Party or Joe Biden. She's running against Rose Twitter, I guess, or like some version oh, of like progressive Twitter. And I found that interesting. Or the person you hate. She's running against like the one DEI official at your child's school or, you know, the one person that annoys you on your TikTok feed. Yeah. Right? Like that's who she's running and, against. And maybe like, that the works. random liberal. Right. Can life. you do that? Can you win elections by running against uh, a cartoon version of a person that people are annoyed by? Or when the other person is just running on the economy, can you? Can, maybe you can win like that because I don't know. I wrote about this on on Tuesday. Uh, looking at the polling data, people are fucking stupid. 
<laughs> and I, you know, I, it, I am mystified by what people think and why. And it's not clear to me that Sarah Sanders' version of this, which is, again, is really the DeSantis playbook, uh, yeah. that that can't win. So, Go ahead, Tim. So I think that, it, yeah, I think it worked. So just for my experience of, of last night, which I think is, was maybe made closer to a median voter, um, I, after about halfway through, three quarters of the way through Joe Biden's speech, was like, I got the gist of this. And um, I'm here in New York City, so I went and met a friend for a quick drink. Caught the end of the Lakers game, Le- LeBron James, now the all-time leading NBA scorer, flipped over to TNT, and then when that was over, went back and kind of rewatched. Flipped on Fox, I wanted to see what the Fox guys had to say about the night, you know, and then flipped on my little social media feed and watched Sarah and, and saw if I, and I missed anything of Biden that way. So in that context, it's, I mean, she seemed repellent, right? But the whole time I was sitting there, I was wondering, and I'm sure you guys take it, since you're watching it through, the tone had to be particularly bad for anyone that watched them back to back, right? Because it's like, what were you do? Like, uh, you know, and that's the danger of doing these responses when, when you don't know what the other person's going to say, right? And and that, you know, her speech was not a response at all, which is kind of how these have started to become anyway, d- traditionally. But like in a particular tonal way, it was like that guy. You know, old Deal and Joe up there complimenting Mitch and like that, like that was the guy, that's the guy that you're talking about forcing you to worship his, <laughs> worship his flag. Like, what are you talking about? So for those people the highly engaged, I think it might've been dissonant for the people that are like, oh, I watched a few minutes of Joe, turned on the basketball game, cooked dinner, you know, went and then turned on Fox News. You know, that I think it probably works for them. Yeah. Sarah? No, I think that's right. Um, but I will just uh, to kind of her, – her, her, she had no substance. Here's the problem, right, is uh, – gosh, if Joe Biden was just even 74 and had <laughs> given that speech, I would just be like, we're rolling into 24. If that's the best these Republicans have, those two visions are such a stark contrast. He's going to crush it because I will tell you on the substance. You know what's interesting is that while I don't – always agree on let's call it the particulars of the substance like that each some of the bills that he's excited about don't necessarily excite me broadly on substance this was a jobs jobs job economy jobs like no social stuff almost at all uh and i was like and again just this is one pushback i think i would have on this like does it matter I do think that Joe Biden has the opportunity to teach some Democrats some incredibly important lessons right now about how you, like, reach the broad middle. I mean, and and coming out of – because, right, one of the things you do with a speech like this that nobody watches or that not a lot of people watch is you, like, win the next day news coverage. And it is all going to be coverage about how he taught – it's going to be a lot of Marjorie Taylor Greene yelling – But it's also going to be like he talked about the economy, talked about the economy. I mean, just hammering on jobs was exactly right. Democrats don't do that enough. Happy warrior. Talk about jobs. Tell people our best days are in front of us. Like that was a good it was good on that substance. And the if if side by side with the Ron DeSantis woke is everything and I'm mad all the time and I'm fighting with you all the time. God, if Joe Biden was 74, I just I just think those those mash. I think he would crush. In that match, and then Sarah, and then and then Huckabee is up there going, "This culture war that they thrust upon us." It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, buy American, two- made in America. Just, what culture we war? Just, we just watched a two-hour speech where he barely fought any culture war points. Like, what are you? Ta- and then you're you're leading off with, you know, of this fully kind of imaginary like war of your own creation. Like by the person who's the first bill in Arkansas that they're putting forth is a ban on drag brunch. Like you're in a, for the first bill of the legislative session in Arkansas is a drag brunch ban, you know? And so, you know, she gets, you have these little moments where it's like the end, like she's like, it's like, oh yeah. And we also have this, I'm announcing tomorrow this education reform bill. And I'm like, okay, that's probably fine. I don't know. Who knows? I'm sure there'll be stuff tucked in there that don't say gay. There'll be stupid t- culture war stuff tucked in there, right? But like, like if 
they're they were so so close, right? Like had you just like re reoriented that speech, right? Like Biden did and made it eighty percent about these substantive things that you think people are mad about, and then throw in a couple little red meat for Fox. Okay, maybe that's a politically viable speech, but her speech seemed deranged. <laughs> Well, I want to I want to add one other thing that struck me is the difference between the parties. So you have Biden, who talked a lot about helping the parts of the country that didn't vote for him. Right. He talked about, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we got to build this. We have this bridge that's connecting Kentucky and Ohio. And, uh, you know, these people didn't vote for him. You know, their their representative didn't vote for the. But you know what? I'll see you at the the groundbreaking. This is important. We got to take another great moment. Yeah. Great line. So we, Great you know, these people feel left behind. These communities, which have been followed, you know, he's like half of what he talked about was helping, you know, basically red America. You know, very sympathetic. These people have been left behind. You get to say Huckabee Sanders, it's all coastal elites are terrible. <laughs> and I, you know, it is pretty obvious that like Biden is interested in the Democrats, again, as a political strategy. I'm not trying to position this as altruism. Maybe he is a deep patriot and loves all people and all God's children. That's possible. But as a matter of politics, his his is an outreach to parts of the country which did not vote for him in an attempt to convince them to vote for him. And the Sarah Huckabee Sanders Republican Ron DeSantis is like, we will attack the parts of America that don't vote for us in order to get more votes in the parts that do vote for us, I guess. That's maybe, is this winning? Is that, is that a winning strategy? For Democrats, not for Republicans. Will it be though? I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I'm genuinely, I'm really serious about this. Like, can you, can you, if you run those two things side by side, which is, I guess what Trump did, right? I mean, Trump, you know, Biden ran talking about, uh, you know, helping helping small towns in the Midwest and Trump ran demonizing people who live in big cities. Uh, so is that going to work again? I don't know. I mean, Josh Shapiro ran this strategy really effectively. Yeah, that's right. For yeah. example, the Biden strategy, you know, and, um, and Josh Shapiro basically did exactly what you're saying, you know, and, and spent a lot of time outside of Philly and Pittsburgh uh, and, and went out of his way to do that. And it paid off. I, he didn't win. It's a margins game, you know, well, he won I, like I don't, 15 I don't points. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and Mastron is a lunatic. Right. But I, what I was going to say is I don't think that he won. I'd have to go to the county by county map. I don't know that he was winning in, you know, Luzerne County or whatever. Maybe he did. I don't know. I'll, I'll pull it up here while we're talking. But um, but 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 even – but that's probably not realistic for a Democrat in a federal race in 2020. But But can you cut the margins down? By doing that, I, it seems like yes. I don't. I think that there was reasonable, there was good reason to be skeptical of that JVL. That that doesn't work. That that's an old, out of date style politics. But like we've seen some evidence the last twenty and twenty two that you can actually tamp down the margins by by running in the Biden Shapiro way, in a meaningful way that matters. Maybe not you know as much as we'd like, but so do so Republicans we- have to run? the way that they seem to want to run like against no. half the country. No. Do Look they no, I don't I mean this really. Can can they can you win a Republican nomination in a you know meaningful place or nationally without running against half of America? So let me just oh, let, no. let me let me contrast. So early Donald Trump, if you go look at early Donald Trump, he also looks happy. Like and he is attacking enemies but he's also saying like, we got to do better for black people and we need this economic. And so like, he actually, I, I mean, I think that part this of the right. problem is that the way that people have interpreted, I need to be like Trump with the fighter all the time is that they are lacking a kind of natural political instinct that Donald Trump did have where Donald Trump was able to bring different people in. And he, because he was sort of culturally moderate, uh, which is like an way overly nice saying like, he had three wives and no moral code whatsoever and like whatever. Um, but but that that helped him in a way that I think he, he's been in an orgy. Yeah, that's, that's culturally right. moderate. That's right. But like people just didn't think that he was sort of a nor- like a weird conservative, you know, stick in the mud, uh, which is, I think, helped him with a lot of these uh, cultural, cultural, um, like not religious working class voters. But Ron DeSantis Unless I don't know if he can discover his inner happy warrior because he's grumpy. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was grumpy, and like that's the dichotomy. Um, and so when Joe Biden last night was just so happy, 
that like radiated off of him. And I think keeping that up, and but I do, Javel, I'm going to push back on this one place or like, or I'm going to ask you, I'm not even going to push back. I just want you to, he comes out like the groundhog and like knocks it out of the park. Winter's over, spring's coming. He doesn't, he can't put the reps in on that, right? Like part of being president and being able to project these things is like being able to do it all the time, right? Because part of it is if he just does it in one speech, I'm not sure, it doesn't, it doesn't break through the way it does when there's sort of the constant, you're constantly in people's faces bringing that energy. And I think that's one of the limitations uh, is, is like, we need this Joe Biden all the time. Like that jobs and economy message is so helpful. It doesn't work. Like the darkness of Ron DeSantis and Sarah Huckabee work if people feel dark, if they feel pessimistic. And so you sort of have to, you got to take that energy, that forward looking positive energy of Joe Biden, but like that has to be pushed and pushed and pushed to help people feel like the better times are ahead of us to kind of nudge people into that happier place. Otherwise the dark stuff resonates. And so I think that's part of the problem. Well, but this has been his M.O., right? His entire campaign and presidency has been a low-key, under-the-radar guy. And that, it has pluses and minuses, right? The, the big minus is that you can't convince people that everything is good unless you're out there saying that everything is good 100 times a day, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is your, your point about what Trump did, right? He would just go around, look, we moved the embassy to Israel. And, you know, he had his three things that he just said over and over. And, and so everybody was like, yeah, I guess the economy is great. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but that's not how Biden ran for president. It's not how he's carried himself out as president. It's n not how he would run for reelection, right? He is a, he's much more, <laughs> maybe workhorse, not show horse isn't the exact right metaphor, but that's just like not where he is at this stage of his life. And, uh, and maybe that's a problem. I don't know. I do want to ask about the age thing though, because the... <laughs> Sarah Huckabee Sanders did basically what Eric Swalwell did during the prim the primaries. Remember when Eric Swalwell would get up on the debate stage and basically shout at Joe Biden, demanding that he pass the torch? Give me the torch, old man! It's time for a gener new generation. And I always thought that's not the way to highlight an age contrast, right? I mean, the, you don't <laughs> you don't actually yell at the old man to give you the torch. And Sarah Huckabee Sanders standing up there and saying like. He's an old man who's 80 and I'm 40. I don't think that's the way. Because, like, again, I think age is probably the single biggest, uh, the single biggest weakness for Biden. I think all three of us would agree, prospectively, for 2024. I don't know that standing there and yelling about it is the way to exploit that weakness optimally. No, that's a show uh, don't tell move. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know if that if Sarah's up for that. Okay, I, I'm gonna just I'm gonna stay out of trouble here you mean and Sarah avoid discussion. Yeah, it. yeah, you you are. Yeah, yeah, Sarah Huckabee. I, I'm just gonna stay out of the 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 image analysis of Sarah Huckabee Sanders as the age contrast. But um, you know, one thing that's worth mentioning is that I don't know if you guys noticed this. I feel like we should have mentioned the Biden glad handing. She comes to this on social media like for an hour after the speech. This also goes to like how he's really in his element. It's almost like he should yeah. give a State of the Union every month. Or they should do a monthly congressional kind of something. I don't know exactly what it is. But um, he was out there, you know, just like yucking it up with the Democrats. Uh, the handful of, of closet normal Republicans, you know, are coming up to him being like, hey – we got to, you know, there's the one exchange, you know, because he's all mic'd up, right? There's the one exchange where the, the guy from California, uh, Lamatha, I think it's Lamatha, uh, is asking about water. And he's like, well, you know, I've been out there four times this year. I'm concerned about the water, too. Or since I've been president, I, I'm concerned about the agriculture. And, like, we got to figure something out. And he's like, yeah. And the Republican guy's like, yeah, and I appreciate that. I was like, oh, there we go. That's on tape. Um, you know, but, like, that was – so he – so to say, I, I do wonder if there are ways to get him – to get him out the, in his comfort zone, you know, that aren't, that, that don't accentuate his weaknesses of, the, of age, right? Which is, you know, some of the straight to camera, you know, so, some of that sort of stuff. Um, some of the interviews, I don't know. I, I'm a little upset we've made it this far. I do want to get into substance of the speech. I have a couple substantive critiques, but I'm a little upset we haven't made it this far without mentioning the winner of the night, though. George Santos. Willard. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Willard in that Mitt exchange. Romney. In that exchange. Yeah, yeah. And then did you see Romney's yeah, post-Biden response? Yeah. No, no, no. The three, Biden, Romney had three moments last night. Okay, this is like 
Trigger warning, we're getting into the bulwark erotica zone here. Okay. <laughs> so just FYI. But like Mitt Romney first goes in, he sees George Santos, and unlike you know, I think, you know, a weaker man that would just kind of roll your eyes and walk by, he confronts him. And he's like, You want to be embarrassed? You shouldn't be here. This is embarrassing. If you had any shame, you would be in the back. I, I, I mean, Romney like lights into him uh, on the uh, on the walk in because Santos like get, you know, has nothing to do, so gets there early to wait on the aisle. Then afterwards, you know, there's a scrum of people. They're asking Romney, "Why? You know, is you know, did you did you tell him that?" That he ought to be embarrassed and that he shouldn't be here, and he's like, "Yeah, he shouldn't be here." It's like, you know, what uh, to to uh, exaggerate is to say you had an A when you had an A minus, which is the best Mormon example ever. You know, uh, like high achieving Mormon like lie that you could think of. <laughs> like, like, that's that's a that's an exaggeration. A lie is when you say you graduated from a college you did not even attend. It's like it's it, you know you're putting shame on the house. Like what do you, it's you should be in the very back. Um, what kind of message are you sending to the children? I mean, just savage Romney on the way out, and then he goes back to his office and tapes like an off the cuff response to Biden. That's like, you know, I just want to start by saying appreciated that, but what Biden said about Ukraine. I was like, totally agree on that. Appreciated what he said about China and how we need to build here and they should be a competitor, you know, not, uh, we should compete with them, not confront, you know, whatever. It's not confront is the word, but not, not being an f- adversary. Should be a competitor, not an adversary. And he's like, you know, and then I had a couple nitpicks. You know, I think that there were a few times where, where Biden might have been exaggerating or maybe he was a little disingenuous, let's say, when making this argument about the debt ceiling or about the deficit, et cetera. But, you know, all in all, I just thought, that you guys might like to hear my response. I'm just like, boy, was that heartwarming. I mean, I was just getting, I was just kind of rubbing myself a little bit while I was watching that. I was like, couldn't this, couldn't we have, why is there only one senator that can is capable of this? Just being like, you know, we had some, there were some merits and there were some demerits and happy we could all get together tonight. Like, how about that? Uh, well, I will just say was, Lisa Murkowski also taped one of these and it was also oh, very that. similar and great. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, it was like, she spent, she up front did a lot of like, appreciated this, appreciated the tone, this was good, agreed on this before she said, but too many Alaskans don't feel the optimism that President Biden was putting. We're like, fine, this is, you know what this is? Normal political discourse. This an adult. is normal political discourse. Uh, I gotta say, the George Santos thing, that guy, the you're right, because he doesn't have anything to do. He like 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 the like Black Sabbath tickets or something. He was like camping out. Just, <laughs> what a freaking what a freaking attention whore. Like I he told you guys this at the sits- live show when Tim was saying, uh, oh, you know, his tolerance for pain. I was like, no, he gets off on this. Mm. He wants to be there yeah. so he's in the camera shot when everybody walks down. Uh, and it is true. I, how did I didn't know? I couldn't tell how everybody figured out what Mitt Romney was saying to him. Like it was like real lip reading because the clips that were coming through, yeah. you I couldn't tell. Uh, the what embarrassment. He was saying. The, you ought to be an embarrassment. I don't know. There's I'm not a good lip reader, but there's something about the word embarrassment <laughs> that is I, I I don't know that just jumped off the screen. Yeah, I thought for me, I was lip reading it. Uh, I also would just like to say about those scrums. I watched that. Uh, And because it was amazing, like he was, I have two things. One is, I don't know how they do it with the walking with 1,000 reporters up against their shoulders, just like lobbing questions at them. I guess you get used to it because he seemed to feel like it was totally normal. But I was like, I would like die of claustrophobia from that. So that was impressive. I will say, watching Mitt be that version of himself about telling lies made me a little pissed off that we couldn't get more of that mitt, that umbraged mitt over lies with Donald Trump. Because it is one thing to go up and give the business to like the freshman who's being publicly humiliated and, you know, because he's a obviously a liar and like looks like a little like twerpy weakling. I'd like to see some of that big bad stuff have been directed at Trump. Um, like every time somebody does it, and takes a moral stand. I'm just remind it like reminds me of how much I know he did. He did during the impeachment. There were points at which he That's did. Exactly but exactly what my Democratic friend said over drinks last oh. night when I was raving about Mitt. And I was like, he voted to convict Donald Trump yeah, twice. No, the only you member of his I'm own party me. to yeah, ever yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. 
uh, he gave he had that black speech. hair with the gray the streaks going yeah, through. Yeah, listen. listen, pretty good. But this is this is always talking about grading on a curve, right? Mitt Romney is the best sure. of a group of people that were, were like atro- yeah, atrocious, right? And so there's still left if a lot Pierre to be desired Delecto on an been, objective moral yeah. scale. You if know, Pierre I, Delecto had been his his actual Mitt Romney feed, it would have been you know a little better. I can't believe I'm going to do this. I'd like to stand up for Mitt. <laughs> so we talked last week. I, I was just I was just talking about Mitt Romney erotica. What more standing up to <laughs> do we need? But okay, go ahead. Last please. week we talked about the desire to change things from within, and in the I early days. I meant we as a group. (laughs) And in the early days of the Trump administration, it was not crazy. It was not crazy. It wasn't my preferred pathway. I didn't think it was likely to work out. But it was not crazy to think that it was important to get uh, responsible grownups into the administration and that maybe that would, yes, the risk was it would legitimize and normalize Trump, but the potential upside is it might, like, save the republic, right? And do you guys remember that photo of Romney and Trump having dinner at Trump Tower? Yeah. Frog legs. That is to me almost like one of those uh, seancey type photos from the 1880s or something where you, the camera is actually showing you the supernatural world because the way Trump is lit, he looks like Satan and he has this, this shit eating grin and Romney is looking at the camera and he looks like a man who has just sold his soul. Yes. And and yet again, I I ultimately think that that was an incorrect judgment, but it's not a, an outrageous judgment. And I understand that I I think Romney was was working hard on an angle that didn't pay off. Oh my god. I just listen, I- I agree with this, but it, I actually want to reach through the screen and like strangle you a little bit because last week <laughs> all you did was mock me when I was making this point about Larry Hogan, who frankly was better than Romney throughout much of the Trump administration because he was a governor, he wasn't there, and he was much, much more aggressive about confronting him on day to day regular things like COVID, where Romney would just Romney has has like I've actually been more disappointed in Mitt Romney. He's like. Mitt Romney's always risen to the important moments, I think. Like, on, he, he voted for both impeachments. He does the right thing when it really matters. And I, I defend him on that all the time. But, like, with Trump, that was never enough. And it's been this post-insurrection part where everybody was like, he obviously, would, Trump's unfit. He's not going to run it. He doesn't want him to run again. Mitt Romney says that clearly. But he also sort of stays in his, well, re- Republicans are objectively always better than uh, Democrats. Uh, in in a way that is like tribal and seems like too important to be on the team. Uh, totally agree. And and I just uh, like with and this is my my thing with with Hogan is like if, if nobody's gonna say the truth, and it doesn't have to be like well Democrats are great now and I love them, but like if you can't identify how dangerous your side is, um and and sort of say it clearly and and sort of fight, um I, I don't then like then they're then then it's all tacit permission. And I, and I, it's not fair because he is the best. These are the best of them. And so maybe it's unfair to like want them to be better, but I just do. Cause I know they know better. Like that Mitt Romney version that you saw with Santos is like, that is the moral clarity that is necessitated in this moment. And also the, the reality is that on a policy basis, they are now guys like Hogan and Sununu and Romney and Murkowski are closer to the center of gravity of the Democratic Party than they are to the center of gravity of the Republican Party. And it's it's a close thing. Like we're going to like stack again, talking about like, you know, the balance where we stack it up and, and weigh it. Uh, it's not like super obvious, but it's it's at least a very close run thing for them just on the substance. Forget the moral clarity stuff and the character logical stuff. Uh and the inability of folks to recognize that. I wonder if, like, the next generation, if the rising generation, like, whoever the 35-year-old Mitt Romney is right now, realizes that he is better off as a conservative Democrat or if he makes an least Stefanik calculation and decides, well, I just might as well go all the way. Like, if Mitt went down with a little checklist, like he had a, he had a ledger and he was listening to Sarah Huckabee Sanders's. Uh, inaugural speech or state of the state or whatever and then Gretchen Whitmer's 
and was like, when he heard something he liked, check, and when he heard something he didn't like, X, and then he looked at the ledger at the end, it would be pretty even, I think, probably. Yeah. It would like, probably be pretty close, you know? And like that's just where he lives right now, and, 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 and that's like hard for him to come to terms with. Can I, can I complain about one substantive thing in the speech last sure. night? And it, we're 50 minutes in. I know people come to us for our, for our figure skate judging. But as a globalist, you know, I'm pretty concerned about our decline. I'm pretty concerned about our decline. And, and, you know, of the Joe Biden things, I can get around on like, oh, we're going to spend a little bit more on this program or that program. And we're going to tax the billionaires. You know, not maybe won't maybe isn't going to be my exact preferred tax policy, but neither was going to be the Republicans. Uh, but I, I really, I really bristle at the, oh, we need every piece of wood made uh, in America uh, na- that that get that gets used on every bridge to come from the trees of fucking Kentucky. Okay, like this is stupid. It is really bad policy. It's like anti-American in a weird it way. Is. Because, like, what America really needs is to be able to build shit. And there was, I, I, and I, sell I it to I other this, countries. And sell it to other countries. And I, and, but in infrastructure, he's talking about this particularly in infrastructure. It's like, for, if there was one example, and, and I, I'm just going to generic, make the cities generic because I, I forget, but I was reading it in the Atlantic, my favorite globalist outlet. And it was like, in order to expand the subway in some American city, you know, it was like, it cost, a billion dollars and took four years to, to expand one mile. And like, meanwhile in Madrid, like they built 50 miles or 500 miles and it cost 400 million. I, you know, I'm just making all those numbers up, but, but like Madrid, right? Not, we're not talking about Singapore, like the really efficient, you know, uh, Asian countries. Like we're talking about sclerotic Europe yeah. and like, it is harder for us to build ships. That sucks. The, our subways suck in San Francisco. Like, that is crazy. That, this, is, this is like the tech hub of the world. Why don't we have a functional subway system? Like, we should be able to build line. shit. Yeah, we should be able to build <laughs> shit that looks cool. Or then fine, then build a fucking monorail. I don't know. Or like do the Hyperloop. I don't know. I like all the smartest people in the world are here and they're making decks for Facebook and, and going through CEQA <laughs> trainings over like the environmental impact of everything. Like just build me something cool. Okay. And like in America, we can't build cool shit because of stupid shit like this. So that like was the one substantive part that I was like, this is, this is bad actually. This is not like not my preference. You know, there are a few things, other things that were like, that wouldn't be my preference, but it's fine. This is bad. And and now both parties are doing it, and somebody needs to stand up for the globalists of the world. Can I? Thank I, you, Peter Thiel. No, I want to be with Tim. No, I'm, I'm he's with, a fucking nationalist. I'm with Tim so no. hard on this. And, and, it, that, that, and those were not the only parts. The protectionist populism that has captured both parties is, uh, is going to crush us. And in part, like, here's the thing. As a political matter... Uh, I thought it was really good for Joe Biden to focus on some of those things. Like, the, there's just no doubt about it. Like, the Buy American, Made in America shit works uh, with Americans. But, like, I, at some point, but it's also, like, part of part of what we are finding comforting is that it's a throwback. Like, Joe Biden's talks, st- things he's saying are a throwback to a time where we understood politics and it felt sort of normal. But we didn't like those as policy preferences. But so that, But they're comfy. We live in a moment where because of the way we are sort of fighting the toxic forces in our own domestic politics, we are missing the fact that we are declining. We don't have big ideas. Like the part that really got to me was the education uh, piece um, where it's like, we're going to pay teachers more. And I'm like, how about the fact that we're graduating 18 year olds that are neither qualified to, to hold a job or go into the military, that we have an aging, that a big part of our aging infrastructure is that we haven't rethought education in this country. And I'm not even talking about privatized homeschooling, you know, any of the conservative stuff. I'm talking about public education. Why can't we get a big optimistic pitch for like how we're going to revitalize education, how we're going to revitalize our infrastructure? Like, I don't want to just fix cracks in an aging system i would like and this is where the age thing sort of does get to me like i am i am i am okay with the fact that just having a normie say normie things feels better than a psychopath saying psychopathic things but we do have to get to a place where the vision is bigger and we are we are we're like 
we can't just, it can't just be like a stupid pro forma. We got to pay our debts on the debt ceiling. Like, I don't know, $32 trillion of debt owed to China is actually a policy problem. It's not all owed to China, but a lot of it is owed to our political enemies. And like, we should be concerned about that. We should be talking about how are we going to compete our way out of this? How are we going to innovate our way around climate change? Like, what are we going to do, guys? And like, we just do have to invite bigger thinking. And uh, it drives me crazy. So, I have a big thinking pitch on education really quick. Right. Uh, are you ready for this? Go ahead. No child left behind. <laughs> no child left behind. Just like kind of a big, big goal. I, I have to say, I, I had the exact opposite reaction, Ooh. Sarah, which is that after the, the authoritarian attempt of the Trump years, which if you're on our side of it, you thought, great, we're losing American democracy. If you're on the... Republican side of it, you thought American carnage after the eight years of Obama, which was this messianic, you know, the seas shall stop rising and we are the ones we've been waiting for. And then the eight years before that, which were all global war on terror. And, you know, like we were afraid to get on airplanes and, you know, we had this Manichian battle of, of Islamist expansion. I was thrilled to have a moment where it's like, yeah, let's, you know what? We could shore up some policy cracks. <laughs> nothing, nothing big going on here. We're just gonna do some nuts and bolts stuff, and I found that deeply comforting in my own way. I get it. That it's comforting. I disagree I do, with you. I, I, no, I, I understand the comforting part. I just we be, again just because of the way our politics has been, we are missing opportunities in a like incredibly. I think we're just gonna look back and think this was a really important moment to start even talking yeah. about doing the AI is things. gonna take care of everything. Well, like we don't. We, Okay, well, with the AI, great. Uh, <laughs> yes. Chat GPT, it's gonna solve our problems. The, you know, the, the vision. Did is, he mention? Did he mention fusion? Mon, Mona Charon's big issue. Did he mention fusion in the energy part last night? I guess there was I some. Opt- this was the one thing the that they were getting in on Dome on Fox. The, yeah, the ten, the ten years. That was optimistic. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a little hot on the other side, on uh, being a little overly optimistic. But there you go. There was something there. Um, the Fox people did not like that. I've got to tell you just a real quick briefing for Fox. I know it's been a long show, but like, uh, as you might expect, just a total alternate universe. You know, I, I tuned in for like 10 minutes of Hannity and my old boss Reince was on there and had the morning show guy with the, the Peg Seth, the guy that beat me on the New York times list. Not that I'm bitter about that. And it's just like, uh, you know, you're talking about speech gumbo. I mean, it's just like talking point, like uh, MAGA extended universe gumbo. I mean, like they're just like spitting out words that had I, it was like hard for me to follow, like what the critique was, because I don't understand fully the context of of the of the discussion happening on Fox. So all of this is to say that, like, for that for that segment. You know, their response to the speech was, oh, Joe Biden's crazy. He wants to get rid of your gas cars. He attacked you. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was inspiring. And that was maybe the best speech since Margaret Thatcher from her. Like that was that was the basic takeaway from him. I, I think that's probably true. But you know what? I, I checked out this morning. I took a spin through dementia Twitter um, because after Joe Biden gives a speak like dementia is always, <laughs> always trending. Uh, and I was going through and it actually was pretty clear to me that there was a little bit of a gulp happening on sort of right-wing Twitter of, "Mm, I mean, he stumbled some, but like, I don't know, pretty hard to argue that guy has full-on dementia. Uh, And and I think that those, and and, and it was pretty, you know, it was a pretty effective, like, because you can sort of count on the punditocracy, including me a little bit, like when Joe Biden is not at his best, to wring their hands and be like, this guy is too old. And that is how I feel often. But like last night I didn't. And I think probably most other people didn't. And that is not great for the Fox news cinematic universe that definitely wants you to believe that he has full on dementia and that Kamala Harris sits back with like a puppet, you know, hand up uh, and, and is just controlling him, which is what they want you to believe. Uh, Dementia does set a low bar. And expectations are everything in politics, yeah, that's right. so that is nice. That is that is one favor that they're doing for us. So well, there. you know, I I suspect that in a week we're going to get a post State of the Union poll that's going to show that Democratic support for Biden running for re-election has dropped even further. Because when I was writing about this yesterday, one of the things that blew my mind is that in October, so the month before the midterms, when Democrats were all preparing for a wipeout. 
52 uh, percent of Democrats wanted Biden to run for reelection. And then by late November, after the amazing successes of the midterms had manifested, that number dropped by like 20 points. And uh, so I, I just assume that we'll get even more erosion in the percentage of Dems who want him to run. Do you have uh, a theory on that? So I read your newsletter with interest because it was just you being exact exasperated by the fact that like people aren't just like clear linear thinkers is one of my favorite part. Like that's my favorite when you do that, <laughs> just because it's like you've never listened to a person because I mean, I just listen to people list contradictions like in the same sentence all the time. And so none of that. Uh, my entire life is organized so that I have to listen to as few people as possible. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Uh, oh, there's an episode of the focus group I want you to do coming up. Um, I'm there. Oh, but now I can't remember what I was going to say, but it was something I was reading your newsletter. You're so exasperated by people. I don't know. The percentage don't want Biden to run went down after the midterms. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you have, oh, I was just going to ask if you had theories on that. Like, why do you think that is? Uh, because they started thinking about the future more. I maybe. think that's right. I, I think they they, like, they just they think... hadn't been really thinking about it, and then they started thinking about it, and they just defaulted to well, I guess. It's too and old. there's some people also in polls. It's important to remember always when looking at crazy poll results that like for certain people, their response is really just signaling my team good or my team bad, mm -hmm. right? And so like it's not everybody, right? But if you say like one in five per people in a poll, which is like twenty percent, which is a significant way, wing, when they get a call that's like, should Joe Biden run again? It's like, yes, Joe Biden, good. Yeah, right. Well, and I'm, it's not I'm, like these are, really these are among a deep Democrats, thought. though. But these are right, right. These no, no, no. But a Democrat. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The Democrats get that question: Should Joe Biden run again? And they say. Well, Joe Biden's good, so yes, right? Like, but it's not really like a, they're not answering the question really specifically, right? It's like anything about Joe Biden, they're going to be like good. And then now, as we get into, oh wait, there might be other choices. There might be right. It's so, like they start to think about that question differently. Yeah. Like that's maybe my my my, my explanation for that's it. That's a yeah. good you theory, actually. I think where after twenty two, people were like, oh, look at all these. Like before that, right? It was the it was the SNL skit, and it was the story I tell about the focus groups where you're like, do you want Joe Biden to run again? No. Who do you want to run instead? And they just stare at you, right? And the SNL yeah. skit is like they run through all the options, and they're like, actually, Joe Biden's fine. Uh, yeah. And now they're sort of like, I don't know, could Whitmer, could Warnock, could the Shapiro guy? Like, look at all these people want that one by big margins. Uh, that said, Dems, strong 28 bench. I do think maybe and maybe we'll, we can, this is like I, the end. Um, I do think that it's probably a fait accompli that Joe Biden runs at this point. Um, I mean, the midterms, For sure. like he has to, to Tim's point, I think there has to be a thing that is a precipitating event that makes not just other people think, but Joe Biden think that other people are so convinced that he can't do it, that he can't. And he's going to get raves today. I think he's going to feel great about it. He's going to announce. And I think everyone's just going to have to live with that. All right, Jack, we'll see how it goes senior year then. <laughs> Did you guys understand that? Because I didn't. I loved it, I, but I, I didn't understand it. Great, it. Though. I'm Good luck in your senior year. Isn't in your like year. It was, Good it luck was. in your it senior like it's, year. It was football coach. It was I, maybe this is a varsity high school varsity football joke that I don't understand. I didn't get I played, like I, I played a lot of high health. school sports. I did not. Good luck in your senior year. Is that? I, just I don't know. Like it, like, if you're a senior, that's like thanks. I think it's kind of like I think I think he was going for you lost. Like it's like your junior year. It's a big game. You lost, you know, and it's like tough cookies, mate. Good luck in your senior year. Like season's over. I, um, I, I don't know. That was, I think, I like, guess a message to the Republicans. Like you lost this one. Tough break. Good luck next round, I think. Oh, All right. I have one question before we get out of here. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. The, 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 speaking of just like weird anachronisms that I have, that like land in a way that if somebody as it was a contemporary did them, I would think was awful. But when he does it, they like sail by is when he calls his wife kid when he's like just like great job up there kid and i'm like i find that to be like revolting as a sort of like a frame in general and yet fine you're a million years old go ahead <laughs> call your wife kid that is good now what, what i think is weird is when husbands and wives call each other mom and dad yeah that's what freaks me out it's like a Mike Pence mother. Yeah, that's a mother that's a weird, says. <laughs> that's a weird thing. Um, is a is Mayor Pete 
maybe adding some gray highlights to his hair, or do we think that's happening naturally? Because Mayor oh, Pete looks distinguished. Really? Age Coming for him this for early? Yeah. He had two age kids. He had two kids with health complications. Do you know what that? Yeah. I know you're he yes, I do know. Treasury <laughs> secretary. Yes, I do know. I remember He's when you treasury had Treasury secretary. He had tri- twins. Uh, you know, transportation. He's aging. Transportation. Whatever. Uh, He's a secretary of some kind. He has to look up, and he has to go on Fox. He's, He's forty one. He's younger than I am. I've got I've yeah, I've got some gray friends. Okay. At 40, 40, 41. I, okay. I think that it's natural. Tim, are you there was a lot yet? of discussion on gay. Yet? None of your fucking business. <laughs> there was a lot of discussion on Twitter. There's a lot of discussion on Twitter about his hair cut. That's an also thing. Sometimes this is something maybe you might remember JVL from when you turned gray. It's like you get a cut, and all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, like it's there are grays under yeah. there, right? And, I, and so there's a lot of discussion about the cut. On, on gay Twitter, and I think that's I think that's what happened. Interesting. Okay. Shut up, Sebastian. Sebastian, how old is he? How Shut old up. is he? Oh, oh my god! All right, it's been a great show, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you next week Good on show, the next long level long show. Uh, go hit all the subscribes, give us the thumbs up, and uh, give us five stars if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Tim, Sarah, good catching up with you guys. See you next week. Bye. Bye.